Policy Institute of Ohio. Thanks for joining us for HPIO's webinar on the social determinants of infant mortality. Please note that to reduce any background noise, your audio has been muted. Slides from today's webinar will be posted on HPIO's website later this afternoon. We're also recording the webinar today and we'll be posting that on our website as well. To start the webinar, Amy Bush Stevens, HPIO's Vice President of Prevention and Public Health Policy, will provide an overview of the report, A New Approach to Reduce Infant Mortality and Achieve Equity. Later on, we'll hear more details of the report from HPIO policy analysts Haley Aka and Zach Reed. If you have any questions at any time throughout the webinar, please feel free to type them into the chat box tool and we'll answer them as soon as we can. And now here's Amy. Happy almost spring. Today, we're going to be talking about a report that we prepared on behalf of the Ohio Legislative Service Commission, which was released in December of 2017. And we encourage you to visit the HPIO website where you can download a two-page summary of the report or a 16-page executive summary. Um, and also the full report is posted on our website, which is over 200 pages long. So hopefully after the webinar today, um, you'll be interested to look more closely at the report. I wanna start by thanking all of the people who contributed to this report. There were over 100 people from around the state, including our advisory group, there was a steering committee, a housing subcommittee, and many subject matter experts. We learned a lot here at HPIO um, working on this project, um, thanks to um, input that we received from many who work around the state with low-income families at the local level, and also from experts in the housing, transportation, education, and workforce development sectors. And this photo is from one of our in-person meetings that we had um, of the advisory group this past fall. We're gonna start with a poll question to get a sense of who's on the call today. We've had over 300 people register for this webinar, which is really great, including some folks from outside of Ohio. And I'd like to give a special welcome to our guests from outside Ohio. Many of the recommendation examples that we're gonna talk about on this webinar are specific to Ohio, although some may still be relevant for your states. And the information that we'll be sharing about the connections between social determinants and infant mortality certainly apply to many different communities around the country. So please let us know with this poll here, which best describes your organization. All right, so the biggest group is from Ohio and based at the local level, but then also some folks at the state level and a few outside Ohio as well. And the recommendations that we're gonna be talking about today um, include things that can be implemented at both the state and the local level. The report also highlights many opportunities for different sectors and organizations to work together, including public and private organizations and sectors beyond health. So there are many ways that the policy ideas in this report can complement the direct service work that many of you may be engaged in. And the thing that's really exciting about the recommendations in this report is that none of them are specific only to infant mortality. If the policy goals in this report were achieved, we would see all kinds of improved outcomes like increased labor force participation, increased educational attainment, reduced chronic disease rates, and many other outcomes that we're all interested in seeing. So there's really something for everyone in this report. These are just a few of the types of examples of policy changes that are recommended in the report. And you can see that we're really talking about going upstream to address the root causes of poor health and disparities. So the first example here is bus system improvements. So the report includes specific ideas for improving bus systems to better connect low-income communities to jobs and to make buses more family-friendly. The second example, occupational licensing reform, is something that's really gaining momentum in Ohio right now. There's some legislation that's been introduced, um, and this is about reducing barriers to employment. 
The last example here, inclusionary zoning, is a policy to increase access to affordable housing, and that's something where we're also seeing some momentum here in the city of Columbus. I'm going to provide some additional examples of policy recommendations, and my colleague Zach is going to be walking through those in a bit. But first, I'd like to start with a reminder about why this work is so important, and then I'll recap the background and process for this project, talk about the key findings, and then we'll get into the next steps for this work. And the last part of this webinar is really important because this report alone will not achieve the changes that we want to see. In order to move these recommendations forward, partners from around the state need to mobilize and work together to let our state and local policymakers know why this is so important. So, if we're so we're going to end the webinar with some specific ideas for how you can get the word out and motivate action. And we have another poll question to pull up here before we dive into the details. So this question is, do you believe that you can influence policy change to reduce infant mortality? So go ahead and select one of those options. All right, so I see there's some hopefulness and optimism in the audience today about your ability to influence policy change. So well over half of you um, feel like you, you can and do have a role in influencing policy change. So that's great. All right, which brings us to um, what we think is um, the most important key finding from this report, which is that improvement is possible. High rates of infant mortality and disparities are not inevitable. Other states have made more progress and we can make more progress too here in Ohio. I know that social determinants of health um, addressing these issues can feel overwhelming. Um, which is why the Commission on Infant Mortality had us um, dig into these topics and do this report in the first place. But really what we learned from doing this work is that there are specific things that we can do to improve community conditions um, that will in turn improve maternal and infant health in Ohio. First, let's talk about why infant mortality is such an important issue. And um, since you're on this webinar today, I assume that you um, already believe that this is an extremely important issue. But hopefully this report gives you some information that you can use to communicate about the importance of infant mortality to policymakers and other partners. So we talk about infant mortality as an indicator of the overall health of a community, state, or country. So it's really a signal of problems just below the surface. And then deeper below the surface here, we have all of these troubling community conditions. These are risk factors for infant mortality, but some of them are also risk factors for other challenges that we face, including addiction and unemployment and chronic disease and many other um, negative health outcomes that we see. And this infant mortality trend rate data for Ohio is a signal telling us something really important right now because we've seen this increase in infant mortality in Ohio in 2015 and 2016. And as you know, Ohio's infant mortality rate is higher than most other states. Back in the early 1990s, Ohio's infant mortality rate was actually slightly below the US overall, but since then, other states have made uh, much faster progress and we have lagged behind here in our state. Only Wisconsin had a higher black infant mortality rate in 2013 to 2015 than Ohio. This slide is deeply troubling and it's a signal telling us that community conditions are not okay for black families in our state. But I think this slide is also ultimately hopeful because if all of these states can do a better job on this, then I believe we can too. 
And this map is also a signal, a signal telling us that community conditions are also not okay for many of our rural low-income families in Ohio. So you see higher rates in some of our um, more rural counties as well as urban counties. Now let's look at why it's so important to address the social determinants of health. This pie chart is showing the modifiable factors that influence our health. And you can see that things like housing, transportation, education, and employment make up about half of this pie. And clinical care is a smaller slice. So this tells us that access to care is necessary, but not sufficient for good health. And we really need to be looking at improvements to factors beyond medical care in order to achieve the infant mortality reduction goals that we wanna see. So this red half of the pie is the focus of this report. And in order to address the social determinants of health, we need to talk about health inequities. Health inequities are differences in the social, economic, and physical environments that are driving the health disparities like the black-white gap in infant mortality rate that we see in Ohio. So this report has a strong focus on describing, addressing, and eliminating inequities. The report also has a strong focus on these priority populations. So these are the groups of Ohioans most at risk for infant mortality, and it's extremely important that the resources be allocated to specifically reach these families. Now I'll talk briefly about the background and purpose for this report. Back in 2016, the Legislative Service Commission on Infant Mortality released a report with several recommendations, and most of these recommendations were then enacted in Senate Bill 332, which was signed into law in January 2017. And SB 332 included a requirement for the Legislative Service Commission to hire a nonprofit organization to do a study on the social determinants of infant mortality. And HPIO was selected to do this work. These were the requirements for the project. And just want to emphasize the first point here, which is that. Um, SB 332 specifically called out housing, transportation, education, and employment as topics that we needed to address in this project. This was a seven month project. And as I mentioned, we had several advisory groups or stakeholder groups advising this work, including a, a um, overall advisory group that had over 100 participants. And now I'm gonna take it to another poll question. So given that the report focuses on these four topics, housing, transportation, education, and employment, we'd like to get a sense of which of these you think is most important. So which topic do you think is most important to address in your community in order to improve maternal and infant health? So please take a moment to fill out the poll. All right, so housing um, is certainly seen as a, a very high priority, and that's very consistent with what we heard from the advisory group during this project. We really heard a lot about how housing is very foundational, and if families don't have stable, quality, safe housing, um, that it's very difficult to address some of these other challenges. Um, and then also 37% for education. All right, thank you. This diagram summarizes how we looked at these four topics in the report. And of course, we couldn't talk about the challenges in housing, transportation, education, and employment without also talking about the cross-cutting factors that are listed in orange along the left here. Poverty, racism, and discrimination, toxic and persistent stress, trauma, and violence. 
The report explores the relationships between these factors through a review of the research literature, and it also describes the scope of problems in Ohio for these issues and describes the current policy landscape. In order to address these challenges and inequities, the report identifies policy goals and recommendations that research indicates will contribute to long -term, the long-term outcomes that we want to see in the red box. And I want to emphasize something else very important on this slide, which is the orange box that says across the life course. This report does not just focus on pregnant women. The recommendations in this report apply to the entire community. So this is really about fathers and grandparents and neighbors and employers and landlords um, and others and really acknowledges um, the importance of the health of women long before they're pregnant um, and after a baby is born. Now we'll look at the key findings from the report, followed by a closer look at the results of the literature review and the case studies that we did with other states. These are the overall key findings from the report. The first two are about the troubling trends and disparities that I addressed in the data slides at the beginning of the webinar. The third key finding is that access to care is necessary but not sufficient. So many of our current interventions focus on health care for pregnant women, which is obviously very important, but sometimes those interventions can be too little, too late. And we also need to focus on women's health before, during, and after pregnancy. The fourth key finding is that community conditions for low-income African-American and rural families in Ohio are particularly challenging. And finally, that state and local policymakers have many options to improve these community conditions. So the report includes many recommendations, and these are some themes uh, that, that emerge from those recommendations. I'm just going to highlight a few of these here. The first is that we heard a lot about the importance of housing and income as foundational. So it sounds like this group is, is certainly on board with the idea that housing is very foundational and important. And of course, income is very important as well. And so employment um, is something that we highlight in the report. Next is given the huge inequities and disparities that we have in Ohio, it is critically important to acknowledge and address the roles of racism, discrimination, violence, and toxic stress. And finally, the report includes some shorter term fixes that are less of a heavy lift, but also some longer term structural changes that are gonna take longer to enact. And we really need to address immediate needs like homelessness, but also more fundamental changes to the transportation, housing, education, and employment sectors to ensure that all families can participate in the economy, build positive social relationships, and attain optimal health. Now we'll look a bit more closely at the results of the literature review. The full report includes a series of these pathway diagrams that summarize the complex connections between each of the four topics and the leading causes of infant mortality based on our review of the research literature. So this is the housing pathway diagram. And in each of these, we list the most relevant challenges and inequities along the left. And the light blue boxes represent intermediate outcomes that are risk factors for the leading causes of infant mortality. The red boxes are the leading causes of infant mortality. And the red arrows indicate that the literature review identified research connecting an intermediate outcome to a leading cause of infant mortality. So just as one example here for housing, uh, forced moves and evictions and living in high crime neighborhoods can lead to toxic and persistent stress, which in turn contributes to poor birth outcomes. This is the transportation pathway diagram. So one example here is that limited transit access makes it difficult to get to healthcare appointments, which in turn contributes to poor maternal health and maternal complications during pregnancy. 
and I'll just briefly show the education pathway and the employment pathway. And if you're interested in learning more about what we found in the literature reviews, I encourage you to check out the full report, which is where these uh, pathway diagrams are. Now let's take a look at the case studies that we did with other states. We identified seven states and the District of Columbia that had impressive reductions in overall infant mortality, black infant mortality, or the black-white disparity gap. So we were really looking here for states that had improvements that maybe 10 years ago looked similar to Ohio, but now are doing much better than Ohio. And we did 23 key informant interviews with respondents from, um, from these states, uh, including folks from the state departments of health, um, the March of Dimes affiliates, and others um, familiar with social determinants of health. We also did analysis of state level data on social, economic, and physical environment factors. When we asked um, these contacts in other states um, for the drivers of the improvement that they've seen, these were the most frequently mentioned factors. And folks in Ohio will know that we are already doing all of these things in Ohio, um, but it is possible that the implementation reach of these efforts might be uh, more widespread in some of these other states. And also, when we looked at Ohio's performance on several social, economic, and physical environment metrics, we found that most of the case study states have better education outcomes, lower child poverty rates, and better economic outcomes for African Americans, and also better air quality. We'll look at two examples here, um, and I just want to give one caution, um, which is that um, there's no causal evidence linking um, the things that the states told us about to their reductions in infant mortality. Um, we did ask for evaluation reports, um, but for the most part, um, states did not have clear evaluation reports that drew a direct line between um, changes that have been made in the social economic environment and the reductions in infant mortality. Um, but they do provide, I think, some useful examples of different ways to address social determinants. First, let's take a look at New York. Um, New York is very impressive because it's a large state with a diverse population, um, somewhat similar population to Ohio, at least uh, upstate New York. And um, New York has really seen some large improvements in overall population health over the past two decades. And New York and Massachusetts had the lowest black infant mortality rates among the case study states that we looked at. In 2014, New York's black infant mortality rate was 8.39 compared to 13.19 for comparable Ohio data. And from a social determinant of health perspective, one thing that's interesting about New York is their robust set of tax credits that support family income. So New York's earned income tax credit, for example, is larger than Ohio's and it is refundable. Um, so it does more to help support the earnings of low income working families. South Carolina has used a novel approach to extend the reach of the Nurse Family Partnership, which is an evidence-based home visiting program that, of course, we also have um, in Ohio. And they um, used a social impact bond with a public-private partnership, including uh, money from philanthropy and a Medicaid waiver and also McVie home visiting funding to really extend the reach of the Nurse Family Partnership. Now I'm going to hand it over to Zach, who's going to talk more about the policy recommendations in the report. Thank you, Amy. Um, and as Amy mentioned, we know that improvement is possible. And in this report, we developed a set of policy goals and 127 specific recommendations for state and local level policymakers to implement. 
So what we'll take a look at now is the connections between successful achievement of the policy goals and reductions in the um, long-term outcomes of uh, poor birth outcomes and reduced infant mortality. So what we have here is um, for each set of topic areas, there's a set of policy goals that is listed in the dark blue box on the left. And research shows that if these policy goals are achieved, we'd be likely to see improvements in the intermediate outcomes that are listed in the middle, which would in turn help us to achieve the um, long-term outcomes that are listed on the right. So for example, um, if we're able to increase housing affordability and increase housing stability, this would lead to decreased homelessness, um, which research indicates would lead to better birth outcomes. For each one of the goals, there are specific policy recommendations. So taking housing as an example, um, for the policy goal, which is to uh, reduce barriers to accessing rental housing, one recommendation is delaying the use of a criminal background check until later in the tenant screening application process or um, implementing other changes that would help families at risk of infant mortality get access to rental housing. In order to increase access to affordable housing in high opportunity areas, one recommendation is inclusionary zoning, uh, which Amy mentioned earlier. And then in order to prevent or reduce the number of evictions, increasing rapid access to legal representation, including landlord ten tenant mediation services was a recommendation that came to the top. In transportation, the policy goals focus on improving Medicaid non-emergency medical transportation, or NEMT, um, improving our public transit systems, improving pedestrian safety and air quality, and then also improving equitable access to transportation services. If we can um, successfully achieve those goals, we'd expect to see improvements in outcomes, including better access to jobs and post-secondary education, and um, decreased levels of poverty and exposure to toxic and persistent stress or air pollution. Transportation recommendations included better monitoring and enforcement of specifically managed care plan compliance with the NEMT requirements in their contracts. Um, and then another that hasn't been discussed yet is um, allowing some people who are under a driver's license suspension to complete community service in lieu of paying that driver's license fee, um, thereby reducing the barriers to employment and other transportation related um, issues for low income individuals. In education, our policy goals really focus on ensuring that there's good access to quality early childhood education, as well as um, career and vocational education opportunities for young adults. Recommendations include increasing the number of children that are served by high quality early childhood education programs, increasing capacity among secondary and post-secondary uh, career tech or vocational training programs, and then increasing participation among Ohio high school students in those types of career technical um, education programs. In employment, the goals focus on increasing overall um, employment levels as well as the income of working Ohioans, and then improving conditions in the workplace, including access to employment benefits. One recommendation specific to, include, to increasing Ohio worker incomes is expanding Ohio's earned income tax credit. Um, would, two ways to do that would be uh, removing the existing cap and then um, making that tax credit refundable um, to Ohio families. Another recommendation that has gotten some traction in the 132nd General Assembly is um, occupational licensing reform or reducing some of the um, training or 
uh, fee requirements that are associated with specific occupations in Ohio, um, for instance, cosmetologists. Then, as Amy mentioned, there's a set of uh, six cross-cutting recommendations that are included in the report. Two that I'll highlight here are increasing local level leadership and advocacy to address the social determinants of health. So um, we, we saw that many of the attendees on the webinar are working at the local level, and we've seen many innovative um, policies and programs coming out of the local level to address these issues. Um, we also hear, heard clearly from our advisory group that there needs to be a focus on coordinating and collaborating and then evaluating um, the efforts that are made at the local and state level, including tracking data um, that's necessary to track disparities and progress on addressing inequities. So now I'll hand it to my colleague Haley, who will talk about some next steps. Thanks very much, Zach. Um, so now we're gonna dive into some next steps. Now that we have this report, how do we move these policy recommendations forward? So here are some things that HPIO has done in the last several months to keep moving forward on these recommendations. We've met with the Ohio Commission on Infant Mortality, which is housed inside our state legislature. And we've met with OCPIM, the Ohio Collaborative to Prevent Infant Mortality. We've also written targeted memos to different legislative committees with policy goals um, relevant to those committees tied right in. And we've had one-on-one -on -one meetings with legislators to get, uh, continue advancing the recommendations in the report. We also see today's webinar as an important way that we're advancing the recommendations of this report. As Amy mentioned earlier in the webinar, we really can't do this work without you and your continued efforts after today. And we look forward to seeing the progress that you make on these recommendations. So this report can be used like a menu of policy options within each topic area, housing, transportation, employment, education, there's a list of policy goals. And within each policy goal, a series of specific policy recommendations that you can choose to lift up. In order to move the needle on a policy goal, it may be important to select both some state level recommendations and some local level recommendations. And we'll talk more about how to move on those different types of recommendations here in a little bit. There are several ways to look at this large group of policy recommendations, right? Zach told us there are 127 of them. Uh, how to look at this large group and uh, prioritize so that it can be helpful in your community. One way to do that is to go in depth on one topic, selecting maybe housing or transportation, and then selecting two or three policy goals within that topic, and then a couple recommendations within each goal. Uh, this makes sense if there's one of these topics that really stands out as a need in your community. Another way to do this is to select multiple topics, two, three, or maybe all four, and then select just one policy goal within each topic, and then a couple recommendations within each goal. Whichever option you choose, there are some criteria that may be useful to you and your community partners as you go through this prioritization process. First, it may be important to think about the policy goals and recommendations and their relevance to priority populations in your community. So how can a recommendation help close the gaps and outcomes between different groups? Another consideration is how a recommendation might align with other initiatives and opportunities currently going on in your community or in the state, and how you can build off the momentum of things already happening in the landscape. The short-term political feasibility of a recommendation may be an important consideration, as is additional resources that might be needed to implement a recommendation. I'll note that there are some recommendations in the report that do require additional resources, maybe additional funding, um, but there are certainly some that do not. Policymaking happens at all levels of government and policymakers in all three levels can make changes that impact the social determinants of infant mortality. This report really focuses on the state and local levels and we'll look right now at how to advance recommendations at the state level. 
So here are a few ways to share information about the social determinants of health and infant mortality and to motivate action on these recommendations among state policymakers. First, you can meet with your legislators one-on-one -on -one to discuss the recommendations in the report. We're certainly doing that at HPIO. You can also invite your legislators to an event in your community, in their district, maybe where you're talking about um, the policy recommendations or prioritizing goals. Another important way to get the word out is to tell stories from your community about how the social determinants or birth outcomes are impacting folks where, where you are. Um, your legislators wanna hear what's happening in their district and they wanna know how they can help. So this is a great way to move this work forward. So here's the political makeup of the current General Assembly. And these political dynamics are important to note as you consider things like short-term political feasibility of certain policy recommendations, or maybe resources that may become available to implement recommendations. This is just important background to note if you're, if you're here in Ohio. It's also important to know who represents you. So if you're not sure who your state senator or representative is, here's an easy resource for identifying those policymakers. And this is not an Ohio resource. This is a national resource. So um, wherever you're joining us from, you can type in your zip code and then your address and a list of your um, policymakers will pop up. If you have an interest in the policymaking process, the process at the state level, and you're looking for more information or how to get involved in this work, we've developed a free online training module in partnership with the Ohio State University College of Public Health. And I'll say that the info in this resource about state legislators and the current General Assembly is just a little bit out of date, but the information about policymaking and how you can get involved in the process is still very relevant. So you're welcome to utilize this resource. It's available at the link on your screen. Now we'll also talk about how to move forward with the local level recommendations in the report. So here are some ways to motivate action at the local level. You can reach out to your local housing, transportation, education, and employment organizations and see what common interests you might have. Maybe there are some policy goals that you can both agree are important and start some action around. We'll talk more about who these organizations are in the next several slides. You could also meet with your local policymakers one-on-one -on -one to discuss recommendations. This could be city council members, county commissioners, or other local leaders. You could write an op-ed for your local newspaper. If you're a funder, maybe incorporate recommendations from the report into RFPs or grant proposals. And then I'll just emphasize again, the importance of gathering real life stories and sharing those. This report is full of data on the state of the social determinants of health and infant mortality in Ohio, but that data really comes to life when you share stories from your community. So in addition to all of these other ways, that's another really important way to move forward. So now I'm just gonna share a few slides of local partners um, by topic area. And this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but these organizations may become important partners um, as you choose to advance recommendations in the report. So here's a list of local housing partners, including metropolitan housing authorities and local continuums of care. Some transportation partners, including the metropolitan planning organizations and transit agencies across the state. Here are some education partners at different points in the education spectrum, from school district leadership to career tech. And then here are some local employment partners, including workforce development boards and Ohio Means Job Centers. You'll notice that local municipalities, um, either your county or city government and legal aid is included at each uh, list. These are important partners regardless of um, content area. And I'll also say that uh, these slides will be available on our website after this webinar, in addition to a recording of the webinar, so you can reference these organizations again as you consider which policy recommendations to engage with and what partners may be helpful in doing that. So now I'm going to pass it back to Amy, who's going to wrap up um, with some final thoughts before we head to questions. Um, this is a great time if you've been sitting on questions to type those into the chat box and we'll get to that conversation really quickly. Thank you, Haley. 
Hopefully Haley's presentation has given you some ideas for how you can use this report in your local community to move these recommendations forward. And we have heard from some of the local infant mortality prevention collaboratives from around the state that they're already starting to use the report, including um, Akron, Cleveland, and Columbus. And this is an example from here in Columbus. Just last week, Celebrate One had its first policy committee meeting, and they broke into work groups for each of the four topics in this report and prioritized policy goals um, from the report to move forward in. And this is the, um, the work group that was talking about housing policy goals. One other example from Celebrate One, um, just to show how they are thinking about the social determinants of health. So you can see in the orange shaded box there, um, they are already um, beginning to work upstream by focusing on housing, transpor transportation, and education. To summarize one more time, the most important key finding from this report, improvement is possible. I know that it feels daunting to take on social determinants of health, uh, but we now have some specific actions we can take to improve community conditions in ways that will improve maternal and infant health. This report provides a roadmap for how to get there. The next step is for all of you to move these recommendations forward. So now we want to check back in with another poll question to see how hopeful you're feeling about this work. So please fill out this question one more time. Do you believe that you can influence policy change to reduce infant mortality? In a minute here, we're also going to be getting to questions. So if you have a question for us, please use the question box and type that in. We'll get to those in a minute. And here are the results of our poll. The group is still feeling pretty hopeful. Um, some of you are still not quite sure about your ability to influence the policy making process. So please use the chat box. Um, to provide us with more information about um, what you'd like to learn more about so that you can get involved in influencing policy. Please go ahead and type your questions into the question box. And Nick is going to uh, share questions with us as they come up. Uh, first one is uh, more of a housekeeping question, so I'll go ahead and uh, handle that one. Uh, someone that joined a bit late was asking if there will be a link to listen to the webinar later. And yes, we are recording today's webinar, and that will be posted on our website, as well as the slides from today. So if you go to our website um, under events, you'll be able to find both the slides and the, and the recording later today. So then to get to the more uh, policy-related questions, um, the first question is uh, kind of a, an employment related question. Uh, has employer medical leave policies been looked at? Uh, infant, infant mortality is not just an issue among low income families, but also those currently employed. There are uh, great examples of how progressive parental leave policies are helping build healthy families and healthy workforce. Yes, that, um, this is Zach, and that was an issue that we looked at um, in the employment literature review and environmental scan. Um, so you co can go um, to the report there and get more information. Um, in general, what we found is that those groups who are at higher risk of infant mortality, including um, people with lower incomes and people with lower educational attainment, are also less likely to have access to employment benefits, including um, paid leave, but also things like um, health insurance coverage. Um, so this is definitely a barrier, um, particularly for those groups at the highest risk of infant mortality. But again, there's more inf um, information as well as some resources in the employment literature review section of the report. All right, thanks, Zach. And uh, this next question, we'll start with Amy answering. What can we or should we implement at a programmatic level without having to wait for policy? <laughs> 
That's a great question, which points out the, the different roles that different organizations can play um, in addressing social determinants. So I think if you are working providing direct service um, and implementing programs, one thing that you can do is to be screening for social determinants of health. So screening to identify, um, you know, are families struggling with homelessness or housing instability um, and trying to track some of that information, even trying to get a sense of which specific neighborhoods or even landlords um, are posing challenges for families, uh, tracking transportation barriers um, and, and also related to education and employment. So I think that's a first step that many, many organizations are already engaging in. And then finding out who in your community is doing this work. And, um, you know, not just to refer families to, but to also form those partnerships to begin to work on policy advocacy. Um, there have been some partnerships with legal aid services, for example, um, in, in Cincinnati, we're um, looking at asthma rates, um, which pinpoint specific neighborhoods and landlords um, where there are problems with housing quality, and then they can partner with legal aid to work on advocacy um, at the local level. So I think there are lots of examples where um, folk, you know, community health workers and others who are working directly with families can start to make those connections with organizations that are doing advocacy and are doing um, policy change. Great, thank you. The next question I think will probably go to Zach first. Um, is the Housing Trust Fund identified as a potential policy solution regarding mm -hmm. housing insecurity? Yes, it is. Um, the Ohio Housing Trust Fund is dis discussed as a um, funding source in the environmental scan um, section of the housing um, section of the report. Um, and it's also identified as a funding source that could receive um, increased funding either through general revenue funds or increased county recordation fees um, throughout the policy recommendations. All right, thank you. The next question, uh, did your reviews find that any of the policies were specifically successful at closing gaps rather than making overall improvements? Um, I, I guess I'm wondering if it's referring to what we saw in other states. Um, I'm not actually thinking of a specific example right now from one of the case studies um, that narrowed that specifically narrowed a gap, making a connection between a, a social determinant of health change and a reduction in the gap. But we did, when we selected the case study states, we were specifically selecting states that had a decrease in black infant mortality or narrowed the gap in some way, the black-white gap in some way. Um, so that was a focus on what we looked at. Yeah, we also in the um, in the appendix of the report there are um, evidence inventories. So this is where we list out specific policies and programs um, that have strong evidence behind them that they um, address the social determinants. And we indicated there the the strategies that are most likely to reduce inequities and disparities. So there were, where there's actually some research evidence that those can reduce those gaps. And so um, there are several that are highlighted in that section. All right, thank you. And the next one is a uh, housing related question. Can you explain more about the delayed background check and how that helps with housing disparities? Yes, so the um, idea behind that policy proposal is very similar to the ban the box, um, which is a proposal that was recently adopted here in the state of Ohio um, related to employment. And the idea is that the criminal background check would not be used in the tenant screening process until after a conditional offer of housing has been made. Um, so unlike things are now, um, where uh, a landlord may go through a series of applications for an apartment and um, push aside any that have a box about uh, criminal history checked, um, 
using this policy proposal, those applications would be processed the same as the others. And um, only after the landlord had selected a tenant based on all of the other criteria, such as you know income, um, rental history, references, those sorts of things, would the landlord look at the criminal background and then um, make a decision about whether um, anything that came up in that check was um, something that would make it impossible for the person to stay at their unit. So it's about leveling the playing field um, for people with and without criminal backgrounds um, prior to that additional, or excuse me, initial offer of housing. All right, thank you. Um, moving on to the next question. Other than interviews, is there empirical or quantifiable data to show the role of these uh, social determinants of health on infant mortality uh, outcomes in Ohio? Unfortunately, the, the case study states that we talked with weren't able to provide us with really solid empirical evidence linking specific changes um, in social determinants to the, the maternal and infant health outcomes. But when we looked at a whole host of social, economic, and physical environment factors um, and analyzed how Ohio does compared to those case study states, we found that they performed better on things like preschool enrollment, educational attainment. Um, they have lower child poverty rates and better outdoor air quality. All right, and the next question. Uh, did you look at all at the connections between birth spacing, unplanned, and teen pregnancy and infant mortality? Uh, the questioner points out that they noticed that a few of the states highlighted uh, have a lot of improvements, uh, as having a lot of improvements, are known for their access to free contraception and particularly um, noted that uh, Tennessee and South Carolina are two such states in the South that, uh, that have made some real uh, strides in free contraception. So again, uh, the birth, birth spacing and unplanned pregnancies, was that, was that, was that connection explored? We definitely did hear um, a lot about contraception access and birth spacing from some of the states that we talked to. In particular, Colorado um, has had a lot of success in reducing um, teen pregnancy um, and unplanned pregnancy with access to LARCs. And so the case study on Colorado digs into that quite a bit. And then we did also hear about that from South Carolina and from some other states as well. All right, and the next question, um, uh, the, the questioner wrote, as incru incongruent as it sounds, has consideration been given to collaborations with area agencies on aging? Uh, AAA staff already have trusting relationships established that could be built on. They're in many of the same homes working with many of the same families. That's a great suggestion. I think there are a lot of connections, uh, certainly when it comes to transportation and housing. So when we look at, um, in the report, we talk a lot about pedestrian safety and bus systems and the same kinds of improvements that we would make um, that, that make neighborhoods safer um, and easier to get around for families with young children are the same kinds of things that are helpful for older adults as well. So that is a Fantastic suggestion. I don't think we mentioned area ages, agencies on aging in the report, but I think we'll add that to our slide deck as another partner for folks to reach out to. And the same is certainly true for housing. So housing quality, neighborhood quality and safety, those are definitely issues that cut across the life course. And I think making those connections makes a lot of sense. All right, and the uh, next question is uh, a bit of a two-part question. Uh, the person uh, first asked, do you get the political buy-in that you need for the policy changes? And then followed up with, are you more successful on the state or local level? Political buy-in is always a challenge, and that's why it's really important for our policymakers to hear from all of you. So, you know, one step is us putting this report forward, um, putting these recommendations forward, but in order to really motivate action on any of these recommendations, it's really important for our state um, representatives and senators to hear directly from their own constituents about why these issues are important. So um, if, you know, at the local level, all of you can prioritize and mobilize and coordinate 
around some key messages, some stories that illustrate these challenges, um, and really highlight what you think is most important. I think that will go a long way in moving these things forward. Um, political feasibility can be really hard to predict. Um, it's, uh, it's always changing and it's definitely a challenge, uh, but there are certainly some policy recommendations, state level recommendations in the report that were designed with an eye towards political feasibility. And there's actually legislation already introduced in the General Assembly um, on some of these. And so um, I think it's certainly possible that some of these things can move forward at the state level. And then at the local level, of course, I think there's even more flexibility and opportunities. Um, and all of you who work at the local level will know better what the political feasibility is for those local level changes. Okay, and this uh, may actually be our final question. Um, are there any Ohio programs currently working on defining and, uh, and acutely addressing prenatal and postpartum substance use, including fetal alcohol abuse? Uh, the, the questioner mentioned that the New York Times just published a study noting fetal alcohol is often missed as a diagnosis prior to a child entering elementary school. And we already know that heroin use is a huge Ohio issue. Absolutely. There are many groups around the state that are working on um, neonatal abstinence syndrome, which we've seen a huge increase in over the past several years. And um, we're actually going to be coming out with a report um, on um, addiction policy issues later this month that will address that somewhat. But yes, there are definitely um, local level organizations. Um, the MOMS program, which started as a pilot and it has now been spread um, more widely throughout the state is, is one example, and we'll have information about that program in our um, upcoming report. All right, I think that wraps it up once again. We have to... one more poll question. Oh. <laughs> I apologize. Don't leave yet. <laughs> Don't leave yet. We have one more poll question. Thank you so much for those questions and comments. And the poll question is up. How would you rate the overall quality of this webinar? Give me a second to fill that out. Those of you who have stayed with us to the end. OK, and I have one last slide. This is how you can connect with us at HPIO. Again, we encourage you to check out our website where you can find the full report. And we will also have these slides posted and the recording of this webinar. Thank you so much and have a fabulous rest of your Tuesday. And you will also have an online survey coming to get additional evaluation feedback. Thank you so much. Goodbye.